Hi everyone, welcome back to Bentley House. I'm Aira and today is another well overdue prompt video. This is going to be prompt number nine. And you could probably tell from the title of this video and the thumbnail, the prompt is actually sock. I'm especially excited about this one because it is a collab with Darkest Raven Designs and I'm also opening up the rest of my prompt videos for collabs with other miniature YouTube channels. I think this will help us all find each other's channels and just continue to grow as a miniature community here on YouTube. So after this video, make sure you check out Darkest Raven Designs video and I will put the link in the description. And also make sure you stay tuned till the end because I always put in prompt pictures of the prompt items that you all have made and sent to me. So let's get started working on the prompt sock. It's not a prompt video without the prompt book, so here it is. And I'll also put a link to the prompt list, which you can find in the description box below if you want to see what all the prompts are at once. I had Chantal from Darkest Raven Designs pick a number, and the number she picked correlated with the word socks. So what you're about to see, we'll just call her fault. Just kidding. As I was trying to figure out what in the world I was going to do for the word socks, I was watching some of my favorite creators and they were all doing tie-dye. Tie-dye? Tie-dye. And a couple of them even went so far as to tie-dye socks. Socks? A whole bunch of socks. That is where my idea for this prompt started to form. Now I do have these socks, which I thought would make a perfect upholstered something, but I still wear these socks. And so I wanted to use socks that I don't wear anymore. And I also didn't want to buy new socks. So I apologize in advance. These are clean socks, but they are old and probably not ones that I reach for much anymore. And maybe soon down the road would be out the door. So instead of doing that, I am going to try and upholster a chair in them. I know I've done a lot of furniture recently, but I just love furniture, so I'm not gonna apologize too much and just keep going. Now, one of the problems with these old socks is they have a lot of pilling, peeling, pilling? I'm not quite sure how to say that word. But I have this machine I've had for a while. It's like a little, has like a little spinning blade inside of it. And you just rub it on top of fabric and it takes the little pills. Am I saying this right? I don't know. It takes the little balls of fabric off and this basically rejuvenates your fabric and makes it look a little bit nicer. Even though this one was obviously discolored in a load of red laundry, it already looks better because I was able to remove those little balls of fuzz. And just a warning, if you've never had one of these little machines before, it does get rather addicting and you will soon find yourself um, defuzzing just about everything. Once I had the material in the best shape I felt that I could get it in, I had to go back and cut off any elastic and then I cut down the like top part of the sock to make it as flat as possible so I had one continuous piece of fabric. And then I wet the fabric and it's at this point this just really doesn't look great because it looks like a dirty old sock you'd find on the street, but it's um, it'll be okay. I promise. Just hold on. <laughs> Just hold on. It'll get better. For this one, I decided to wind it up into a like cinnamon bun type swirl and I don't have rubber bands. I actually don't have anything I probably need for this project, but of course I'm just going to try and do it anyway. <laughs> That's what we do here on Bentley House Minis. So I'm using some string to tie this in a swirl and then for the other two socks I decided to do an accordion type fold and then I'm going to tie the strings around it to try and hold it in place. Of course, if you want to do tie dye for real on socks or clothes that you will wear, I highly suggest you check out one of the other videos. I will put links in the description to the other videos I had previously mentioned. They know more about what they're doing than I do. Since I don't actually have any tie dye ink, I am going to attempt to use acrylic paint. I do know acrylic paint will stain fabric. I don't know if it will work for clothes you will wear, but because I'm turning this into a miniature chair, I don't feel like I have to follow such strenuous directions to make them 
wearable because it's not going to be wearable. For this tie-dye project, I decided to stick with all cool colors. The reason for this is if you accidentally get one of the cool colors mixed with a warm color and they happen to be complementary, they will mix and create brown. So I'm just sticking with all cool colors. I also realized I had these inks and I had a green ink and a blue ink. That's really all I have. I don't have, <laughs> I have black also, but this is all I had. So I decided to add ink into the mix. Just, I don't know, I guess I didn't quite trust the acrylic paint to do its job. And then I added some blue into the purple and that ended up being a mistake because I guess the ink is more powerful than the acrylic paint. And so I just ended up with two blues. To fix this, I do decide to make one more mix of purple and I use both of the blues, but they end up looking the same in the end. I don't have a dropper either or a squeeze bottle, another thing I am missing for this project, but I know that paintbrushes are made to absorb water and transfer them, so I decided to try and use a paintbrush for this. I start out with a smaller one and then switch over to a bigger one and then basically just hold the container of the paint water over my project and just try to get as much of it onto the sock as possible. I learned from watching Mariah Elizabeth's video that you need to get the fabric wet first. This is what helps the dye, or in my case, paint, water spread and fade into each other. Just the wetness of the material helps the wet ink kind of flow throughout the fabric a little bit easier. In my head, I had kind of pictured the swirled one to be kind of the back of the chair and then the ones that I'm doing that were kind of accordion folds to be the sides of the chair. So that's why I'm trying to make them match. That's not really what ended up happening. But as you can see, here are the dried pieces. It's a lot more faded than I would have liked. This one, the one on the left, is way more bright than the other ones. So I'm not quite sure how that happened, but um, now it's time to make these into a chair. And I've also found these other socks that have holes in the toes, so they are on their way out as well. And uh, so I figured if all else fails and the tie-dye chair looks horrible, I can make something out of these. So now I need to come up with the plan and the pattern for this chair. Some of you might remember this pattern and uh, this chair from one of my previous videos. It's one of my most popular videos, but for a long time now, I've been wanting to show you all how you can change this pattern for yourself, show you how to adjust the pattern. If you're not interested in pattern making for your own chairs, you can skip forward to this timestamp. I drew out my design idea and this was based off of Ellie's chair from the movie Up. I really have always loved that chair and wanted to recreate it, so I figured this would be the time to try it out. First thing I'm going to do is cut out all my pieces from the original pattern and make sure I have my sketch close by so I can change this pattern into the new pattern. I'm going to start by slipping some notebook paper up underneath the original pattern and these are just pieces A, B, C and two pieces marked D. These are going to be basically the outside of the chair and so I am adjusting these first. To begin, I'm going to kind of figure out where the differences in the new pattern I want to create are. I want the new pattern to be taller and more rounded at the top, and then I want it to be a bit thinner at the bottom. And this is, I'm just talking about the back of the chair, because the piece we're working on right now is the back of the chair. So what I did is I put two marks that were a little closer in at the bottom. I'm going to use my ruler to connect those marks, making a little bit more of an angled piece than we had before. Now I'm going to loosely sketch an arch at the top because this is very reminiscent of my sketch and of the Ellie's chair design. It's not perfectly symmetrical, but I will take care of that later. Right now I'm just sketching out the idea. I also need to connect the two pieces at the bottom 
and there we go we have the first piece that's going in the direction of our new design Next, I need to adjust the arms of the chair. So you can see the changes between the back and the new back, the old back and the new back, there we go. So now I need to update the arms of the chair as well. I need to decide the parts of the pattern I wanna keep and the parts that I want to change. So the parts that I wanna keep, I can basically just trace. I want the chair to be the same depth as the original, so that means the same distance from the back of the chair to the front of the chair. So I'm gonna keep that line the same. I want the arms to be a little bit shorter than my original design, so I'm not going to take that line all the way up my original pattern. I'm making the arms just a little bit shorter. Once I have that done, I can focus on how tall the arms need to be. I want them to be a similar shape, so I'm just starting that shape a little bit more towards the top of the new back, and then I'm going to connect the shape so that I have my final piece. Later on, I do need to further adjust this, but this is a great place to start. I don't need to make a second one of these because I will just match it on the other side. I do a couple things to change the seat base. One thing you need to keep an eye on with the seat base is that it's actually much wider than the back. This is because we need room to glue all the pieces. I'm going to start by making sure that I have the same overhang on either side of the back of my chair. And then I'm going to have the same area that's needed for glue on the side. But instead of being straight, I want to make it at an angle. And I'm gonna do this on both sides again. It may not be symmetrical, but we will fix that up later. By putting it at an angle, this means that the arms of my chair are going to flare out instead of just going from straight from back to front. I'm also wanting the front of the chair to be slightly curved, whereas the original pattern is more straight along the front, I am curving this one. So as you can see, there are so many different things you can do to change these patterns. Um, that's why I think this would be, this is really a good thing for me to show you because you can just take this pattern and create whatever kind of shapes you want. This is the point where I make sure things end up symmetrical. I'm just going to fold any of the pieces I'm not quite sure are right. And once I fold it, if I have any overhang, I can just take my scissors and trim those up. Because this is an upholstered chair and made from foam board, it's really flexible. Your, your pieces don't have to be 100% perfect. Uh, you just wanna get a idea of it and then the upholstery will kind of cover up the rest. So you just want to get pretty close to what you want. I also need to even things up on the back of the chair. So like I did the bottom, I'm just going to fold it in half. If there's any overhang, I'm going to trim that off with my scissors to come up with a symmetrical design. Because this pattern is just like my original chair pattern, but with different shapes, I am putting the letters on each one of the pieces. So if you do want to create this chair, you can go back to my original video, which I will put a link in the description, and you can watch it and put together the chair in the same exact steps. It will just be with different shapes. So now that I have the outside of my chair, which is A, B, C, and two Ds, I need to work on the inside pieces, which are E, F, and two Gs. The outside pieces are made of foam board. The inside pieces are made of thick paper. You can also do the seat of foam board if you want. The best way to know how to make the interior pieces is to compare them. So this is the original back compared with the original interior piece. You can see that it's a little bit thinner on both sides. That means whenever we make our new interior piece, we know how much we need to cut off. Also for the arms, you can see piece B compared with piece G. You can see that G is not as deep as B because there is a line there that shows that's where you are gluing things. So if you've made this chair before, this will make total sense. If you haven't, it may not make a lot of sense, but I do have that video that I will link, which will make a little bit more sense. <laughs> so now you can compare 
E and D and you will see that um, there's quite a bit of space around E. So when we create our new E piece, we will know we need quite a bit of space. I'm going to speed through this a little bit. I highly suggest if you decide to create your own patterns, download my original chair pattern, download my updated chair patterns, cut the pieces out and start doing some comparison and you will really start to understand how I have updated and changed these patterns to fit the chair shape that I want. I'm now taking my outside pieces and I'm sketching them onto some more notebook paper and this is going to help me figure out where I need to make my interior pieces. From our earlier comparison with the original pattern, we know that piece G is much less deep than piece B and so that's why I cut off that back part. And finally, I'm going to trace piece D, which is one of the exterior pieces made from foam board. I'm tracing it so that I can now make it much smaller, and this will be piece E, which has the same borders as it did in the original pattern. And this is how I'm going about changing the pattern to suit my new shape needs. So here you can see the originals, they're a little bit cut off at the top, but my originals compared with the new pattern. On the left, I have the exterior pieces, and on the right, I have the interior pieces. I also did this again with a different shape. I made this one shorter, I made the top straight, and the chair is also a little bit wider, but I followed the same exact steps, and you can really do this with so many shapes. So now I'm going to be cutting the exterior pieces, which were A, B, C, and D. I'm going to cut them out of foam. This will actually be the test on whether my pattern was good or not, because I can actually put the pieces together in 3D form. As you can tell, the piece that is marked B is not working so great unless I wanted like a bat wing, which is totally possible, but that's not really what I'm going for. So what I want instead is I want to round off the top of B so that it comes down and meets the back piece. And this is all part of pattern making is just figuring out what you need to fix as you go along. And remember, if it's a pattern you want to keep for later on, to go back to your pattern and adjust it there too. So now that I like how that's looking, I'm going to make the other piece match it, and then I can start gluing everything together. I'm not going to go super in depth on the process of putting this chair together. It's exactly the same way I did in my original video, which has very clear and concise steps. Also, this one is going to be upholstered with a sock, which is probably not everyone's favorite upholstery material and probably not something I would use if I didn't have a sock prompt. I would probably use some kind of cotton. Oh, at this point, I realized that my arms were just a little bit too long. Again, this is part of the process of making your own pattern. So I went back, cut those off, and now it's working great. One nice thing about working with this pattern is you can kind of fill any gaps or any imperfect spots with some hot glue, or you can easily shave down the foam. I'm going back with a hot glue gun and just kind of reinforcing all the corners, making sure that the hot glue is as flat as possible. At this point, I'm trying to figure out what is going to look the best on the chair. I knew I wanted the knit type lines to be going up and down, I want to use that to my advantage. I know that it's not typical that there is knitted fabric on a chair, but if it was on a chair, it would probably be going vertically, would be my guess. I was also trying to gauge which bits of the tie-dye were the best parts because obviously I wanted that on the front of the chair, but I also wanted the back of the chair to look pretty good as well. There are benefits and drawbacks to working with the sock material. One of the benefits was is that it was really forgiving as far as like pulling at the fabric and trying to pull it over the foam board. When you're working with cotton fabric, it 
has very little give. So if you cut it a little bit too short or you don't have enough material in one section, you're kind of out of luck and have to start over. But with the sock material, I found it had enough stretch and give, which it has to for a sock, that I could pull it in the direction I wanted it to go and it would usually do what I wanted it to do. I also found out that not all socks are created equal. <laughs> And so some socks worked really well with tacky glue and I had no problems and some of the socks needed hot glue for it to really take hold. So if you do try this for whatever reason, you will need to test that out. Here you'll see the interior pieces and you see that I have to adjust my pattern again because I'm just testing everything fits. These are what's going to be upholstered for the inside of the chair, but I have to go in and cut those pieces off that I originally cut off on the exterior of the chair. Working through uh, making chairs and upholstering chairs is definitely a process, but the more you create them and the more you build them, the more you will learn the little tricks that go along with getting them to look the way you want them to look. I'm using quilt batting for this chair just like I did in my original tutorial, but as we found out in the cardboard house, there's lots of different things you can use. You can use felt, you can use cotton balls unraveled, and so don't feel like if you don't have quilt batting that you can't make this, you still can. You just kind of have to be resourceful, and um, I just happen to have a lot of quilt batting. Once again, I am test fitting everything. You will notice that I test fit a lot, and this is to make sure that if anything doesn't quite work, I just have to go back one step in ha instead of having to go back several steps um, when I get too far and realize I've done something wrong. Now, the one thing I did not anticipate that I'm about to find out in this video is that the sock is much thicker than cotton. And honestly, I knew that in my head, but I didn't realize how much more space it would take up within the chair. So if you are going to upholster with a sock, I highly suggest you cut down your interior pieces much more than I did. I ended up making it work, but uh, you need a lot more space for sock material. If you decide to do this with cotton material, like I did in my original chair video, I don't think you need as much space because cotton is very, very thin and doesn't take up that much more bulk within the chair. So now it's time to insert the interior upholstery pieces. I'm using hot glue for this. I don't know if it's the best idea, but I wanted to be able to really squish the pieces in there and have it take immediate hold. The only thing is just make sure you don't get, if you try this, don't get hot glue on the fabric because it's nearly impossible to get hot glue off of fabric. But here is the first piece inside the chair. And honestly, I'm really liking how it's coming along until I put this back piece in. You can tell that it's folding over. There's just not enough room for this back piece in the chair. However, I decided to just continue to go for it because the look of this chair is supposed to be kind of overstuffed and comfy and chunky and so I really wasn't bothered by the fact that it wasn't absolutely 100% perfect. I wanted it to look like an old knitted chair. So I just kept running with it and you can see I'm trying to save it here with a tool just pushing some of the sock into the corners to flatten out the face of the chair. In the end, I like how it looks, but if I were to do it again, I would definitely cut down those interior pieces so it fit a little bit more smoothly. Same exact situation for the seat of the chair. I felt like it stuck out the front a little bit more, but I made that work by adding a little bit more glue. And then I pressed down the front and this actually made the seat of the chair look like it was spilling over the front a little bit. And I thought that actually looked kind of cool. 
Now you may have noticed that there were flower patterns on my original design, but they're obviously not on here. So um, in the spirit of Ellie's chair from Up, which is what I was trying to recreate, uh, just in different colors, I guess, I wanted to try and make those happen on the chair. So I took some of that ink that I originally put into the dye that I tried to tie dye the sock with. I used a very, very thin paintbrush and I just used Ellie's chair as inspiration and I very delicately painted the ink on top of the knit. I made sure to use the straight ink and not add any water because I didn't want the ink to spread out further than where I wanted it to be. It did spread a little bit because obviously I'm putting a wet medium onto fabric and so it spread just a little bit, but I think it worked really well. I liked how it looked and so I just kept going. Now I don't know if it tricks the eye enough to look like a pattern that's been knitted into the fabric itself, but I think it added a little bit, especially because my original tie-dye was a little bit faded. I think the pattern added a lot and kind of saved the chair itself. Now using the sock material, I think made it so that I didn't have to finish the edges of the chair really like I did in my original design, but I wanted to try and make a braided effect, especially since this was a knitted chair. I wanted to use something else to do with string. So what I did was make this braided bit of embroidery thread that was in this green color. So it kind of blended in. It doesn't, it doesn't stick out too much, I think. And I'm just going to go down the crack that's made between the outside of the chair and the interior pieces. This makes it look like the chair is one finished piece, at least in my opinion. And I think it gives it just a little bit more interest. Oh, and I did want to note, make sure that your ink is dry before you handle the chair and do to anything else. I, luckily this ink dried fast, but you don't want to be messing with it. For the legs of the chair, I dug through my stash and I found these wooden beads and a few wooden pegs. And I thought it would be interesting to try and glue them together to create some fun, kind of interesting shaped legs to go with the interesting shaped chair. I'm just using tacky glue to glue them together. I'll do that to make four legs and I'll just make sure to let them dry really well before I glue them to the chair. Before gluing the legs on, I did add a piece of watercolor paper or it could be also like um, cereal box material to the bottom of the chair. This is to create a nice flat surface because the bottom of the chair is actually pretty um, lumpy once you add all of the um, sock kind of going over the edge. So adding that paper was really helpful and then I could just glue the legs wherever I wanted on the bottom. I also wanted to paint them with acrylic paint so it looks like they are all one piece. And you might have seen earlier I went back and forth trying to decide whether I wanted the bead first and the little flat parts on the bottom or the flat parts on the top and the bead on the bottom. Um, I think really they could have gone either way but I really like how they turned out in the end. So that's the end of this chair. I will make one more, so hold on just a few more seconds, but I'm pretty excited about how this turned out, especially since it started with old socks that were on their last leg. I'm going to blast through one more chair really quick because I just could not not use the Darth Vader socks and I had already created this pattern. It's going to go together the exact same way, um, but I just couldn't throw out my Darth Vader sock that had a hole in the toe. I'm also going to be using this black sock that has a hole in the side. I'm going to use them together because I only have one Darth Vader sock. And you may have noticed I typically talk about socks in the singular and that's because I don't really match my socks. So it does turn out a lot of times I just end up with one of the certain type of sock. And um, anyway, I have a weird relationship with socks. So this... <laughs> whole project ended up being really fun. This is how the Darth Vader 
chair is turning out with the black sock on the outside, the Darth Vader sock on the inside, and then I did square pegs for the legs and painted it gray to match the sock. So yeah, it was really fun. If you would like to participate in the prompt sock, make sure you tag me on Instagram with Bentley House Prompts, or you can send me a personal message on my business Facebook page, Bentley House Minis, with a picture and you could be featured in my next video. So now we're going to look at all the prompts from the last video and beyond. I'm always happy to show old prompts as well, so if you're someone who wants to go back, look at the prompt book, see what they've missed, and catch up, please do and just make sure to tag me. Also, it helps if you let me know what prompt something is from because with the creative mind, it's not always completely clear. And so I don't want to grab something that was from something else because sometimes things can be two different things. So just let me know when you post something with hashtag Bentley House Prompts, let me know what prompt it was for. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Make sure to go check out Darkest Raven Designs video. She did something completely different to what I did and I think that's the fun part about opening the prompts up to collabs because then you get to see multiple viewpoints on the same prompt. I will also link the two patterns I created in this video in the description box below if you want to download them. They are just hand-drawn simple patterns but it might help you be able to see exactly how I changed them and adjusted them so you can make your own patterns yourself. Just a little disclaimer, I have not tested these patterns multiple times like I usually do before I put patterns out, but I knew some of you would be interested in the specific patterns I made in this video, so I wanted to make those available to you. Just know that you may have to adjust them a little bit when you are making your own chair. Final thing I want to add here at the end of the video is a little reminder that I have changed my schedule. I know I'm still uploading on this Friday, but going forward I will be not, I will not be keeping to such a strenuous schedule and I will be working on projects and as I get them finished I will just go ahead and upload them to YouTube. So make sure you're subscribed, you have the notifications turned on so you won't miss the next time I upload a video. I hope you all have an amazing week and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. I hope you, <clears throat> I hope you all have an, <clears throat> I hope you, <clears throat> goodness. Last line of the video, can't get it out.